We're going to kick off the conversation today, Bernard, um, with the, the kind of core question, I think, for, for this panel discussion, this panel discussion, which really goes to how the um, Zandili, um, I want to get this right, the emerging coal producers, Bernard, as opposed to the junior coal producers, um, experience the impact of, of COVID and Zandile. Um, is, of course, with Black Royalty um, Minerals um, operating Kurenfontein. Um, so, Zandile, how bad was it? Um, and what was the, the impact that your business saw um, in those early days of, of COVID? Yeah, um, thank you, Sandra. And, um, and thank you to the organizing team for, for having me. Um, I think um, our industry, like many other economies in the world, um, hasn't been spared from being affected greatly by this pandemic. And of course, um, South Africa's economy was already on its knees even before COVID hit us. We saw a um, couple of downgrades last year and already our economy was, was, was not doing so great. So we, when we saw the decline both locally and internationally in the demand of coal, um, in fact, when I read the International Energy Agency Coal 2020 report, I quote, they say the coal demand has seen its biggest drop since World War II, unquote. So a notable impact was the decline in international demand that led to an oversupply of coal in the international markets. With the lower demand in 2020, coal prices recorded a third year successive decline and the prices were averaging around 65 US dollars per ton. Due to the pricing pressure, the value of the total SA sales decreased by 6, point, by 6 percent um, to about 132 billion rands. And this is according to the statistics published by uh, Minerals Council South Africa. Input costs for SA producers increased by 6.9 percent last year, and the production declined by 2.4 percent. And of course, as expected, people directly employed in the coal mining also decreased by 3.9%. What we also saw um, locally, ESCOM declared a force majeure beginning of the hard lockdown last year. And this was as a result of electricity demand that reduced by 5.1% in 2020 when compared to um, 2019. With all that said, fixed production cost remained the same if it didn't increase at all. And no price in guessing how severely the emerging miners were impacted by this. In fact, um, some of the some of emerging miners were even at the brink of shutting down and, and Shemi will, will attest to that. But as, as we've heard earlier in the sessions in the morning that um, the recent developments and looking ahead shows that there's an increase in the international demand and the corresponding um, prices have increased. And I think in my view, um, two things have led to that. One, the China placing a ban, a ban on Australian coal markets. The thermal coal prices recorded significant increases. And secondly, the strong um, Asian demand. So I really strongly believe that as emerging miners, we need to be more conscious and playing more uh, meaningfully in increasing our export and taking advantage of the prices as they are. And beginning of the sessions, we, we heard that we are looking at these prices as they are in the $90 per ton being with us or at least remaining in the next five years or so. Um, so I really think that we should, as coal producers and more specifically, and as emerging miners, this is the industry that we need to export. This, this is the industry that we need to exploit, exploit more. Okay, Zandile, thank you very much. And, and we're going to come back a little bit later in the session to, to talking about what the things are that as emerging coal producers we can be doing. Um, but I want to take your invitation to Shami. Um, and Shami, this impact um, that Zandile has described, it, it forced you to rethink your capital allocation and it, it forced you to, to dip into your pockets. So, so for you, what, what was the opportunity cost? What, what did it take from you to keep going? And, and what do you think the impact is going to be of that um, into your business in, in the near future? Um, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Um, 
I will try uh, to be as brief as I can be about this. <laughs> and I'll try and do it without being emotional uh, because I think the cost of it has been very severe. What have we given up is basically, we have given up the near term future to basically make sure that we survive now. And what I mean by that is that we had to go, look, you are producing at suboptimal capacity, as Sandile has mentioned. Uh, you are forced to cover the costs of a mine that is supposed to either set up, produce 100,000 tons a month, but you are only producing 50,000. I mean, it's a catch, almost a catch-22. You don't want to go and let go of employees when you believe that is a temporary measure. Uh, so you do your best to try and keep them, and hopefully, you know, the market basically turns as it has. So there was a real cost of production uh, that hit all of us, and I think it basically starved us an opportunity where we could be able to have cemented our space within the industry and even market share-wise both locally and internationally. Um, and I think the third thing was that we have had to go into debt to sustain operations. And I don't have to let anybody know, you want to do that when you're busy spending capital to grow. Uh, so most of us, and I think to answer your question, actually, legacy-wise is such that we now have to go through a period where we need to repay that debt without having to invest on the future if any, and I think the whole uncertainty of it all going forward is such that the legacy of it is such that my belief is you will see lack of investment in coal mining in the near future up until those who are good enough have recovered fully to be able to start putting money into any future projects. So that is, I suppose, the legacy of it. And I think if you top that with the whole uncertainty around how we're going to get go green and all of that, we now have to think very carefully. I mean, I think Morle will, att will attest to it as well and almost anybody. Are we brave enough to think that there's a project with a billion rents that you want to go and do? Uh, so it, it has hurt us in a manner that we will think a whole lot harder to go into new projects to, or to even invest. You probably might just want to look at what you do internally and maximize production out of it. So, Shami, all of those facilities that you had lined up to expand your business, you've now had to, to sort of pour into to keeping the business going. We, yeah, we cut back a lot. Yeah. Mona, you, had, you were caught in a tricky spot when lockdown hit, right? But you actually had a very different experience in terms of support network. Um, to what um, Shami and Zandile um, has explained to us. Um, because you, um, with Minergy, have the good fortune of, of being in Botswana um, and, and, you know, sort of having a different um, government infrastructure around that. And I think it will be really interesting to the audience. So if you can maybe share with us your experience of where you guys were um, when lockdown hit and, and what that meant for you. Hi, thank you, Sandra, and uh, afternoon to everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Shami doesn't want to get emotional. Maybe I will. Um, I think COVID is uh, it's, uh, the effect on, on the coal industry and especially on emerging or junior miners is underestimated because a junior miner is <clears throat> not as protected as uh, the big players. The knocks that we take is significantly bigger. So... Let me say up front that um, we didn't escape any of, of COVID. All the challenges that was faced by our competitors and so forth, we also experienced. Um, we, were, we were approaching COVID uh, relief packages, um, financial institutions, because we in coal mining, it doesn't matter if it's COVID. They still applied commercial hurdles. So I found that very strange uh, during times like this. So your, those type of avenues were closed down. Um, we tried to raise additional equity um, as a listed entity. You can, you can imagine that COVID uh, forced people to put their money in their pockets, sit on it and decide to go forward with it. So all the traditional avenues were closed. So um, we were fortunate that in Botswana, um, we approached government. And in terms of their legislation, they do have um, the ability to buy into your mining operations um, at a very, let's say, market-related type of mechanism. 
Um, it's not a take for free or free load or something like that. So that's where the process has started. So we were always in engagement with them because they were always interested in taking up some kind of stake in the business. So that was the initial. And from there, because our doors were closed in our faces for, through the traditional avenues, we, as Shami had to do, had to resort to debt. Um, normal debt was not available. Um, if, if you walk into a bank, um, and even if you wear a suit, and I've only got one as a coal miner, they don't allow you in because, you know, you know you, you coal, and never mind coal, you're a startup business, so significantly different. So we are very grateful to the Botswana government for recognizing, firstly, that coal is a strategic asset, asset for them. Um, you know, they sit on uh, over 200 billion tons of coal. And, you know, our Honorable Minister of Mines was quoted the other day by saying that, um, you know, it's important that we are uh, subscribing to a cleaner world. But, you know, it would be a significant sin if you leave all the abundance of this God-given resource in the ground. So I think that's the right attitude. Um, and because of that type of attitude, uh, doors were open to us. The financial institutions that are linked to government, uh, state-owned institutions, development corporations and the like, were willing to sit around the table with us. It was very difficult. Let's just understand that because um, open cost coal mining Botswana is quite new, had to get their heads around it. But when you have people around the table that have got the right intent, and they see the, the, the bigger picture, then you can work through all the, the, the long processes and the expensive debt and so forth. And, and because of that partnership, um, you know, I believe that's how saved our bacon. We, we're also in a situation where we wouldn't want debt, but because of where we are, we are now in this position and very, very grateful to the Botswana government for doing that for us. Thank you, Mona. I mean, as tough as that story is, it's, it's something that's very, very encouraging. And going to that point, there's a very specific reason that the Botswana government, um, you know, kind of helped you around um, this, um, keeping your operations going and, and sort of being an effective competitor in the market. And that is because you're sneaking your toes across the border and, and stealing Shami and Zandile's lunch, right? You, you're eating their sandwiches out of their tuck box while they're not looking. So do you just want to tell us where you sort of see um, that market opportunity um, for yourself as a Botswana coal producer? Because we've heard Zandile talking um, earlier on about the export market, export prices and the opportunity. What is it that you are seeing that they may not be seeing or may not be interested in? Yeah, I, I, I believe it's probably not being interested in um my colleagues are well well versed with the coal industry, so <clears throat> it's choices we make. So for Minergy, it was quite clear that the business model from the start, although it had the opportunity to do power generation, supply, or follow export, although it was uh, as a landlocked country, Botswana disqualifies itself immediately. We, um, as a management team, have got experience in the sized coal market, and that is the regional market, the industrial market in South Africa, and. Um, from all our history and our trading days, that's where we supply our coal into. And we believe that is a segment in the South African coal industry that is a small segment. I mean, <clears throat> if you read some of the statistics, the market is probably as big as uh, between 30 and 34 million tons. You know, that's dwarfed by what Eskom takes or what Sassol takes and so forth. So, you know, people run towards those because they're probably the low fruit. But in terms of that market, we've got our cement industries, we've got a cement uh, chemical industries, we've got steel industries. Importantly, we have breweries, you know, hospitals and all those type of things. They need to be supported. And that's the market that uh, we believe uh, requires support. Now, what happens typically in the South African market is that um, the, the domestic market is the black sheep in the, in the family. If there's an oversupply of coal, okay, wonderful. What are we going to do? Prices drop and so forth. When there's an undersupply, all the coal is pulled off the market and the industrial market must go find coal. So they suffer from what I call a consistency of good quality of supply. They switch on and switch off because the export market and the, and, and the, the power generation market gets uh, you know, all the preference. So we're, we're comfortable to supply into that market. Uh, if people don't want to supply in there, we're very, very happy to take uh, um, a portion of that market. Also, we are fortunate because we've got certain logistical advantages. We, we located... Uh, quite south in Botswana, we're quite close to the northwest province. 
And, you know, we have logistical advantages delivering product into the cement industry. We even have uh, logistical advantages uh, on par with the Middleburg area into Cape Town. So, you know, we look at that market. We're very privileged to, 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 to handle it into that market. It needs to be supported. Um, and that's the backbone of the infrastructure industry in South Africa. You know, so we can't, we can't let them down. And uh, if you look at our significant resource, the consistency of qualities, I think we're very really well placed um, to assist them. And that's a segment that we've identified. Not that we're not interested in, in, in ESKIM. We are shortlisted to supply coal into the Tutuka power station. We have um, opportunity to um, support export. You know, the Mamabula Lepalale link is very important for Botswana. And again, going back to my previous conversation, the support that government and the focus that they've got, they want to develop this. So that link is going to be built. We know it's probably 23, 24. Um, and that will link Botswana to the RBCT corridor. And that will make Botswana coal um, quite competitive because then you take, you know, the logistics cost and we're on par with that. So very exciting times. But uh, that's where we're focusing on the moment on the Indian market. Thanks, Mona. So, show me the man there on the screen. I think uh, just uh, if I look at the AV desk here, just to your left on the screen, um, with his hand in your tuck box from over the border, where do you see the market for Indalamo um, and emerging kind of producers? And, and a specific, uh, you know, kind of question um, that's come up in this conversation is around this transition um, to a low carbon economy and a just transition to a low carbon economy. And what does that mean for a producer like Indalamo that, that sort of needs to find its way? And, and if you could have a similar kind of a relationship with government to, to what Mona has with his, what is the conversation that you think needs to be had there? Well, Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure where to start on that one. Uh, I, I I had to go and actually quite check what the definition of a low carbon economy is. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. And that's just because um, we mine carbon. Um, and, 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 and I think by mere effect of saying just that, I think for us, the way I look at the low carbon economy and how we play on it, it well, the transition specifically, I actually think for us to survive going forward, we need to start looking at what the end users of our products are doing with our products. And that's because we mine carbon. You know, I, I think, I'm not, unless if I don't understand metallurgy very well, but I can't see yourself washing coal such that you have less carbon, you know. So from that transition point of view, I do believe that we need to start looking internally as in our own operations to number one, how do we chase carbon neutrality like everybody else is? Whatever it is that we can change that minimizes the impact on, the, on carbon emissions internally first. And I actually think going forward, whether banks want to give us money or not, uh, we need to start looking at that such that we can say to the banks, look, guys, just like an Amazon, they're not chasing zero carbon emissions. They're chasing neutrality. Uh, neutrality does not mean you don't emit. You know, I think we need to start there. Number two, we need to then start working with the end users of our coal. You gotta know whether they have got the necessary technologies to be able to make sure that what they're not supposed to emit, they do not. How long that will take, I am not sure. But I think for us, we really need to start paying attention to what happens with our coal. And I think specifically to South Africa, it might actually jumble up with what you've asked. ESCOM seems to have this problem in some of their power stations. One of my views is how do we work with the government slash ESCOM to see if whether junior miners or emerging miners don't find ways and means that should ESCOM get tired of looking after them, we say, look, we can get them to emit less, leave it up to us, find a ways of giving us the opportunity to, uh, because that is another way where we will be able to, sus to sustain. I think from a mining perspective as well, we need to be able to say, look, where, where do we start with all of this? And one of the things I, I think, uh, again, I, at the risk of sounding like a politician who refers everything to government, which I don't, which I don't like, I, I do believe that we need better coordination such that we know who is doing what way, such that either you can work together to make sure that it's impactful. I'll give you an example. 
You have got Arnold Power Station, for an example, where there might be three or four or five of us who supply it. And then tomorrow I might hear that the ESCOM board has decided they want to shut it down. What if amongst five of us, we can be able to amass enough capital to be able to convert it into something greener? I, I do believe that that is the transition that coal miners will have to navigate and go through. Export-wise, those who play, I think that we will have to work with whoever buys the coal of us. You know, the very same thing that we get from banks when they say, are you equator principle certified? At some point in future, we will have to certify what those who buy coal from us are doing with it. So as you can see, it sounds very complicated, but because it is. Um, it has got many facets of it, both economic, environmental, financial. So it is something that I believe that either from the Minerals Council, whether it's from government, it needs better coordination because it needs investment in technology. Are we able to extract coal and mine it better such that we leave what we don't necessarily have to extract in the ground and not take it out? Do we have better technologies that are not so much intensive on some of the stuff, meaning X-ray, better X-ray sorters and stuff like that, you know, where we don't have to use as much water and electricity and all of those things. So there are many facets. And I think from a junior perspective, we will struggle to be able to come up with the might that a mineral council has where you are able to fund research to be able to do all of this. We definitely want to be part of it such that we can prepare ourselves better and be able to exploit these opportunities as they come through. Thank you, Shami. And, and that was really a little bit of where the tongue-in-cheek um, polling question sort of came from, was to say, if we're transitioning to a low-carbon economy, what does that mean for junior producers in numbers? And what is that engagement between yourself and government around the participation, the program, the schedule, etc.? And I think that brings us uh, back to Zambile, um, back to where we started this conversation. So your team has a slightly different view on the breadth of the role that an emerging producer can play in the overall energy mix. And maybe you can just share with the audience what that view is and what your specific plans are around um, participating in this process. Um, it, I, I don't necessarily think it's a view, um, Sandra, I think it's a reality. Um, we, we find in ourselves, particularly as, as BR, um, in a maybe call it a, a better position as, as what Shemi was saying. Um, after having acquired Goran Fontaine, obviously it comes with an allocation in Richards Bay. So we, we, we are able to play um, meaningfully in the export markets. And I think um, somebody asked um, Xavier earlier on that why are juniors going out of business? And um, Xavier's answer, he alluded to the fact that it's because the juniors are, are overexposed to ESCOM and that is a fact. Um, and um, my opinion is that they're overexposed to ESCOM on, on mainly on two reasons. One, it's because of the nature of the qualities they are deeming themselves to be that of domestic um, qualities. But also secondly, um, there isn't enough allocation in Richards Bay for all the emerging miners so that they can export their coal through the Richards Bay coal terminal. Um, if you look at the Richards Bay, RPCT has a, a theoretical capacity of about 91 million tons, and 95% of that is sitting with the shareholders. Yeah. Only about 4 million tons is administered by DMR under the Quattro allocation. Now, that is not enough for um, the junior miners that we have to play meaningfully in the, in the export um, position. So I'm, I'm saying it's, it's, um, it's not a different view, and it's a reality that we find ourselves as BRM um, because we have a, a slightly better um, position because we have an allocation of ours and we do not necessarily have to now um, rely on the, on the quattro allocation. What I think the government has to do um, about that, I certainly think there is a conversation that needs to be had insofar as increasing that, that our allocation for the junior miners so that they could also, we could, I'm saying they, um, actually we could also um, as the emerging miners play in the, in the export uh, market meaningfully. Yeah. Shem is mentioning also something very interesting as far as um, the consortiums that can, you know, look at taking over the power plants that ESCOM is looking at um, mouthballing. We heard earlier on from the uh, ESCOM colleagues, they spoke about the Gomadi, Rutfle, and I think Hendrina as well, 
um, with Komati being the first power station that they're wanting to, to repurpose. I certainly think there is a, an exciting conversation and an opportunity for us as, as emerging miners to come together and look at that um, very closely and see what are the, 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 the opportunity costs that can come with that. And certainly there's something that we could do if we put our um, all our miners together and see how we can best position ourselves to be playing um, in, in, in the generation of power as well. Mm -hmm. Monet, I'm going to swing back to you because you and I chatted about this um, this notion of whether you focus on your, your core business of mining or whether you sort of put your toe into the power generation game because your other coal producer in, in Botswana really is very much focused on, on that captive power game. Um, what are your views in terms of where Minergy has decided to focus its business and to focus its energy? Yeah, so we, we have to play to our strengths. Um, and um, as, as we shared in our uh, good discussion, <clears throat> you know, for, for us to, to, to maximize value for our shareholders, we believe that uh, the quickest way to monetize coal in Botswana was to follow the route of sending it into the regional market in South Africa. If you look at a, a power station setup or a waiting for an export line or rail line to be built, you know, you, uh, you've got to share all this money, what you're sitting and doing with it. Um, so, you know, we're quite cognizant of that. And the, the quickest way for us was uh, the regional market. Um, a, a power station takes a long time to develop um, and, and the like. So we, we, we playing to our strengths. And from a strategy perspective, we will supply the coal into that market because that's where we our expertise is. We have been asked to supply into Eskim in terms of the tender process. So we will we'll already start crossing and diversifying our markets. As I've mentioned earlier, we will play in the export market. But so, so those are the uses of coal that we believe that we should um, uh, take advantage of. It doesn't uh, preclude us one day from building our own power station or assisting the government to do something like that. But we have to get a stable um, foundation. Um, as my colleagues will uh, confess, it's very, very difficult to get into a stabilized environment, especially now with COVID and the like. So we take all the money that we've got very seriously. We turn, we don't have sense here, we've got tear base. We turn the tear base um, around quite quickly and make sure that we get the, the most bang for our buck here. And so that's why the business model must get you onto a stable platform before you have these, um, these greater prospects that you can see. I want to say something else. <laughs> I, I'm laughing, Mono, because I know that uh, that you use an expression that includes the word grandia um, <laughs> when we were first having a chat about this. But maybe you can just also quickly um, use the opportunity to give the audience a sense of the advantages that you think you've got on a basis relative to South Africa that we spoke about. So, so what makes this open pit coal mining in Botswana something that 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 you think is is quite competitive, despite as you have mentioned the fact that you are landlocked? Yeah. So <clears throat> you, you're going to laugh when I'm going to share this with you, but um, we were talking. I was listening to some of the participants this morning, but we've we've got lower input costs. We as Botswana get our fuel from South Africa, but we pay cheaper for our fuel. So, you know, the conversation about the significant amount of levies built into it, it's quite ridiculous that we use South African fuel, make Botswana coal and sell it back into South Africa. So, you know, I think that's the first point. The second point is, I think, in terms of tax legislation, you know, it's quite friendly on this side. Um, the tax rates are lower. Um, government is willing to assist in terms of economic development zones and the likes and so forth. So, we, 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 have, we have those type of things. So, you know, those are the two main ones. You know, we, we are fortunate to have some good geology on this side. It gives us um, lower strip ratios. And then, as I've mentioned to you, you know, at the end of the day, coal is a logistics game. And um, if we can deliver the, uh, the coal to our uh, end market at a cheaper rate because of distance, then we're going to do that. And that's, hence, our location is uh, significantly in our favor. The Northwest promises is across the border, and that's why we have you know, good offtakes into, into that market. So those are the ones I would think of up front. That really kind of stand out from a competitive perspective. I could see uh, Shami and Zandile's eyes wide in the minute you said that you get, uh, get cheaper fuel on your side. And, and Shami, maybe I can just sort of loop back to you because this is something that you had mentioned in your, um, in your kind of uh, conversation to say that 
as a junior producer, um, you guys really need to either band together or you need to get some support from the Minerals Council um, for the industry sort of overall. Um, and I was wondering if you just want to expand a little bit on, on some of the ideas that you shared with me, um, you know, technology and opportunities that coal miners could look into um, if there was research support from, from the Minerals Council to help you guys explore um, new markets or, or, or new ideas or, or, or new business models. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Marne, for rubbing it in. Eh? We... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think these are some of the structural issues that are worth actually discussing in South Africa that affect us. Um, uh, funny enough, I actually do believe that there is a lot of opportunities if there were structural changes. I mean, I, at the risk of sounding controversial, I mean, um, I'm not a believer that ESCO must be the only producer of power using coal in South Africa. You know, I think those days are gone. Uh, we've got hungrier people who are willing to go through uh, learning and uh, coming up with new technologies that can have low carbon impact going forward. I mean, you're not saying that because you hate ESCOM in any way, shape or form. But if you want to make use of an opportunity of a natural resource that we have bestowed upon us on the ground, you can't basically try and go and sing, create a single market for the coal at the detriment of the greater good. I think let's set the standard for everybody such that they are the same, meaning whatever is required for ESCOM to produce coal, whatever are those requirements environmentally, you know, Zandile can be given those requirements. And if she can be able to pull in capital to do so, why not? Why does it have to be just ESCOM alone who are given that opportunity to do so? So, I mean, I, I think the second part about it is definitely a gain. I mean, are there incentives in play that get us to be able to say, look, one of the suggestions that I think I have is to say, look, how do you come up with incentive schemes for juniors that make sure that the so-called low carbon transition we were talking about? And the reason for that is we are bottom end faders. We count every rent that we've got. We do know how to have the kind of a muzzle that uh, the Mineral Council will have to be able to go and sponsor global wide research on some of the stuff. But if there are benefits out of it, if there are outcomes out of it that we can be able to go and implement in our operations, in our industry, we'll definitely love to have access to those. So, and, and that is why I honestly do believe that it must be a multifaceted approach of how we transition towards that. And I think thirdly, my own hypothesis here uh, is such that I think in future, if we're gonna do things well, we might have to find ourselves where we consolidate as an industry. Uh, as well. We might have to find ways where we can work together such that we can be able to share the good out of coming out of my neighbor somewhere else such that we can then be able to. And I think logistics is a case in point. Uh, some have siding, some, some don't, and all of that. So there has to be either consolidation forced by circumstances or, you know, uh, basically way of cooperating such that we can all be able to lobby some of the things that Zandile was talking about as well. So look, let us all go and find where Ms. Minister Mantasha is and say, how do you get us more allocation out of Richard Spain? How do we get access to Transnet as well, such that we can get trained? So I do think that there will be more cooperation in the coal space going forward. I think we need to scream a bit louder that there is deregulation of power power generation in South Africa such that uh, we are able to give people an opportunity to do things better. So, Monne, so you are the neighbor next door, who steals our water, you steal our diesel cheaply, I mean, you know, and then you come and sell it back the cabbage to us at discount prices. <laughs> Surely that's not sustainable. But seriously, I mean, so there's, I mean, anything around the resources, energy, supply, strategic supply to ESCOM, surely there's an overlay of national interest and even nationalism in it. Uh, are you experiencing any of that? Are you foreseeing any of that? Can you really win a, a, a request for a, a supply uh, um, from ESCOM as a, as a, as a neighboring supplier? Just unpack it a little bit for us in a minute or so. Yeah, so of course we can. Um, uh, we're, quite, we're quite confident that we can supply to Eskom. But one of your speakers this morning uh, put it very well, that we have to look at Africa as a continent and we have to band together as, uh, as, as, as the SADC region or Southern Africa and so forth. So we shouldn't start picking 
where is the miners located? You know, we have a problem with um, energy poverty in, in Africa and uh, they all should come together. So I am I'm fully for supporting um, an African approach. That's the, the bottom line from our side. So we, we, we starting to see that in the working relationship between Transnet Freight Rail and Botswana Rail. They want to build, build the, the link between the two countries. So there is that collaboration. So, you know, we see a, see a lot of these partnerships accruing for the benefit of the African continent. So we shouldn't sit there. We, we all have to get our minds up and running and so forth. But at the end of the day, we have to look at the end goal, and that's energy poverty. But Shami could not get the government of Botswana. It's great once you are bailed out. But is it fair? Is it really fair? And is it sustainable? If it, it's, a, it's sustainable if your government supports you all the way. So, you know, in, 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 our, in our case, I don't see um, our government turning around and um, changing the tune and putting blocks in, in, in. And that's the bottom line. That's the difference. Sorry for Shami. Um, I know exactly what he's going through, but um, that, that's, that's, that's the, the bottom line. And, 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 and the government's come out publicly about that. Yeah. And I mean, government should compete at the right level. No, they should not compete by preventing businesses. They should compete by enabling businesses. And there's a lot our government could do to catch up with what other governments are doing. And Botswana is a good neighbor, a good neighborly example. I mean, you know, we don't have to go to <laughs> Singapore or Canada. We can actually look at Botswana to see what can be done. Guys, this was such fun. Sandra, you always make it a very entertaining and uh, an in-depth conversation. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for your participation. Eh? Thank you. And good luck with all of your strategies and dreams. Eh? And please emerge so that we can call you, I don't know what then. Eh? <laughs> <laughs>